Thank you, Robert. Great to be here and to have a chance to speak to you about this very basic aspect of the Christian life, and yet as we will uh, see this afternoon, sometimes it's easier to talk about trusting God than it actually is to trust God. And I want to uh, encourage us all to do that and to provide uh, help from the scriptures uh, in that regard. Uh, if you have uh, your Bibles with you, if you could turn to the book of Hebrews, and I'm going to read just some parts of Hebrews chapter 11 and then Hebrews chapter 12. Not the whole thing, I'll just indicate where I'm actually reading from as I go. But we'll start in verse 1, Hebrews chapter 11. Now Hebrews 11, of course, speaks of faith, and we will explain the connection between faith and trusting God uh, in just a moment. But uh, this is an appropriate text for us to read together. Hebrews 11, starting at verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And then going near the end of the chapter, down to verse 32. So there are a number of examples of faith that are given, uh, starting uh, in verse 7. Well, it's already talked about Abel and Enoch, but goes on to speak about Noah and Abraham and so forth. And then if we go down to verse 32, uh, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. And there were others who were tortured, was refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet not one of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And then just the opening verses of chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Trusting God in a post-pandemic uh, age, at least we hope it's uh, post. We're going to put our emphasis uh, on that important little word. Well, trusting God, as I said, is, is a basic uh, component of the Christian life, 
And it's one of those things that you think you understand until you try to do it. Uh, trusting God is an aspect of saving faith, and so that's why it was appropriate for me to uh, read that famous chapter on faith, uh, Hebrews uh, 11. When I say it's an aspect of saving faith, uh, theologians have long spoken about three things, three elements of faith that saves, that is faith that uh, links us to God and to Jesus Christ and uh, brings us into the possession of, of salvation. And the three elements are as follows, knowledge, assent, and then trust. Uh, in order to uh, have saving faith, one must have some knowledge of the object of faith. You've got to, you've got to know certain things about, about God and about yourself and about sin and about uh, what God has done for sinners in Jesus Christ. There's uh, certain facts that uh, need to be understood. But more than that, we need to assent to the facts. That is, there has to be an agreement with the facts. Someone may know all kinds of things about Christianity factually and yet not really think that uh, these uh, facts, this information is correct. So someone who has saving faith knows certain things and acknowledges the truthfulness of that information. But there is this third component, this uh, really essential component without which uh, the other two are, are meaningless, or I could put it another way, without which our faith is no different than the faith of demons. Provocative statement, but it's uh, one that comes to us from the New Testament letter of James. Uh, he talks about the fact that the demons believe in God and they tremble. So they have a knowledge of God, and uh, it is a knowledge that they uh, would uh, all agree is correct. They know there's a God. They know what he's like. In fact, when they think about God and they, uh, they consider his, uh, uh, who he is and all that he's doing uh, in the world, they tremble. But they remain demons still. Why? Well, although there's knowledge, although there's a scent, to that knowledge, to those facts, there is not trust. And these three things uh, must go together, must be found together when we're talking about saving faith. So trusting God is an essential part of the Christian life. It doesn't mean that it's easy, especially in a world like the one in which we're living, and we're thinking here of a post-pandemic world. Uh, it is... Um, challenging, uh, almost really impossible for us to trust in God unless God himself enables us, unless we experience what Stephen was talking about in the exposition of, of uh, Psalm 119, that the Lord teaches us. There's a certain amount of information that we can glean for ourselves, but we need the Lord to teach us uh, in the inner person so that God's truth comes home to our hearts. Uh, with power. Well, the Bible, as you might imagine, given the critical nature of trust, has much to say about it. And uh, one of the uh, things that we want to uh, begin with is that the Bible commands us to trust in the Lord. You see this all over the place. I'm just going to pick out a few select texts. For instance, Psalm chapter 4, verse 5 says, Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, very well-known verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. At the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus comes preaching a message of repentance, tells us to repent tells us to believe the good news. And this, of course, is something that only, not only marks the beginning of his ministry, but it marks the beginning of our walk with God as Christians. There comes a point in our lives where we repent of our sins and we put our faith, we put our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is not 
a once action. This is not uh, something that just characterizes the beginning of our Christian lives. Our Christian lives are to continue to be characterized by repentance and faith. So we repent and we believe, but that leads to a life of repentance and a life of uh, putting our faith, our confidence, our trust uh, in the living God and in his Son, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're called upon, in the words of John 14, verse 1, and also verse 6, to believe in God. Uh, Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on to say, of course, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I've read from Hebrews chapter 11. Let me read again verse 6. Without faith, and remember this faith uh, contains this component of trust, this essential component of trust. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. If you turn to the writings of the Apostle Paul and you go to a passage like Romans 5 and uh, you start reading at verse 12 and you read right through into chapter 6, say verse 14. You can read, just keep on reading. You'll see this everywhere. But in that center section, you'll discover that one of the things that separates uh, distinguishes those who are in Adam from those who are in Christ uh, is this saving faith that has this component of trust. Uh, Christians are those who have been joined by God's grace through faith to Christ. We've been baptized into him. He is the source of our life, a bond that is secured by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then just uh, one other uh, text with regards to the command to trust, and that's Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, uh, where we're told to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So faith and trust uh, are wrought in us by the power of God through the ministry of the Spirit. And it will evidence itself uh, in our response to God, in the, what Paul talks about there is working out our own salvation. We work out our own salvation. We obey what God has said uh, in his word. We put our faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but we're reminded in this passage that all of that is done by grace, for it's God who is, who is working in us according to his good pleasure and his will. Well, when something is, is so ubiquitous in Scripture, when you've got a, a command like this, trust in the Lord, found in the Old Testament, found in the Gospels, found in the Epistles, then it shouldn't be a surprise to discover that there are uh, many inducements to trust. There are, there are many things said to encourage us to put our faith in God. And I want to spend... Uh, some time looking at those, and then to draw my message to a close by uh, some words of practical application. And it's those words of practical application that start to get to, you know, how do we trust in God today in the uh, current environment in which we're living? Well, how does the Bible encourage us to trust in the Lord? Well, it does it uh, by directing us to the perfections of God, the promises of God, and the actions of God. Uh, it does it by giving us numerous examples of individuals who have gone before us who have put their trust in God. And uh, in these ways, uh, it uh, challenges us uh, to follow in obedience uh, in the uh, kind of ways that uh, Christians have walked uh, before us in the past. Okay, the perfections of God. Everything about God is uh, trustworthy because of the perfection of his being. I mean, you can trust in God because he is God, uh, because he is the thrice holy one. Uh, he is perfect and flawless and in all of his ways. Well, the 
importance of trusting in God and encouragements to trust in God uh, come to us uh, in two different ways in the Scripture. Uh, they're taught uh, by means of negation, and they're also taught by uh, a, a description of God's glory. When I say by means of negation, one of the ways that we're told to trust in the perfection of God uh, is uh, we, are, uh, we are given ample uh, instruction about the folly of putting our faith anywhere else, right? So the Bible spends a lot of time talking about the insanity, really, of trusting in anybody but the Lord. And, and, and why is it doing that? Because the, the, the message that we're supposed to take away is, well, if this is crazy, if it's crazy to trust in all of these things, then the wise thing to do is to put my faith in God. So you, you kind of get that way of approaching uh, the issue. And then, of course, it swings around where we just have, you know, open declarations as to who God is. And if you have any understanding of what the scriptures are saying, then the obvious response is, well, how could I help but not trust in God? I mean, uh, this is absolutely the wisest course of action. What about uh, warnings? Where are some of these warnings found about the folly of trusting in anyone or anything else other than the Lord? Well, first passage that always comes to my mind is Proverbs chapter 1. In the last half of Proverbs 1, starting at verse 20 and going to verse 33, wisdom is personified. Wisdom is spoken about as a, a person, in particular a woman. And uh, wisdom is pictured as crying aloud in the streets of the city, raising her voice in the markets, calling anyone who will listen to her warning about foolishness and, and the danger of disregarding reproof and counsel. She's calling people to pay attention to what she's saying. She's uh, urging them to be wise. Uh, she chastises scoffers and fools because they hate knowledge. They hate the fear of the Lord. They choose to walk in their own ways. And they put their confidence, their trust, in other things. Now, these other things are expounded in the rest of Proverbs and in the rest of Scripture, for that matter. Uh, for instance... Uh, Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 5 says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and who makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. In other words, it's very, very foolish to put our confidence, our ultimate confidence, our allegiance in man, in human beings. And if we do that, we are in fact turning away from the Lord because only the Lord is worthy of our absolute allegiance and trust. Proverbs 25 verse 19 says, Trusting in a treacherous man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. If you've never had a bad tooth yet, be very thankful. <laughs> and when you do, you'll maybe remember my words. <laughs> and you'll remember this proverb and say, man, they can, teeth are small little things, but they can really be problematic. And when you're trying to negotiate uh, the sidewalk in the middle of a Canadian winter, uh, you sometimes know what it is to experience the foot that slips. Well, the writer says, trusting in a treacherous man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth or a foot that slips. In Kings, 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, and you could add to this Isaiah 30, verses 2 and 3, and Isaiah 36, verse 6, uh, these Verses all basically say uh, the same thing. They're going to say what I, I'm going to describe, and I'm going to paraphrase, uh, paraphrase for you. Behold, God says to Israel, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, 
who will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and all who trust in him. You know what the issue is? The issue is the fact that throughout the Old Testament, one of the things that Israel did over and over again, where they entered into political allegiances with the pagan nations around them in the hopes of saving their own skin. And they did that instead of what? Instead of trusting in the Lord. And so they would pay money to purchase soldiers. They would, uh, as I say, formed alliances with uh, the peoples around them, arguing to themselves that this was in their best interest, that this would, this would preserve their national integrity. This would keep them from becoming, you know, overtaken by the foe and, and, and disgrace. But God said, it's never going to work. And the example that he gave in the text that I read for you was Pharaoh. Why do you, why do you keep trusting in Pharaoh? Pharaoh can't help you. He's just, a, he's just a human being like you are. He says he's a broken reed of a staff. That's how God viewed Pharaoh. For all his pomp and circumstance, for all the wealth of his court, he's just a broken reed of his staff. And he'll pierce the hand of any man who leans on him. You lean on Pharaoh, and he's going to disappoint you. He's going to, he's going to let you down. He's going to do you harm. Trust in me, the Lord is saying. We've got another series of texts uh, represented by Say Proverbs 11, verse 28, or Psalm 52, verse 7, or Jeremiah 48, verse 7, or 48, verse 4, all saying something similar. Whoever trusts is in riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Whoever trusts is in, trusts in riches. So don't trust in political alliances. Politics is not going to solve your problems. We're going to come back to this at the end. You've got to be careful I don't go down this rabbit hole too early. <laughs> but we're living in a day and age when Christians are all of a sudden finding out about politics. At least that's how it seems. And they think that political action is a way to solve our problems. They're mistaken. It has never been the way that God does things. Politics is a dead end. It serves some useful purpose in terms of God's common grace, but in terms of advancing the kingdom, it's a mistake. And so is trusting in riches. So is cozying up to wealthy people. Frankly, I would never trust a wealthy person. I wouldn't trust a poor person either. Everyone's got their own interests, their own agendas. You're a fool if you trust in wealthy people. Some of the craziest people in the world today are ridiculously rich. But their wealth is going to sprout wings and fly away one day. And, and even if it doesn't during their lifetime, their years will come to an end and they will be gone and uh, buried in a cemetery or not, perhaps in some of their cases they'll be frozen in a, in a vat of chemicals in the hopes that they will grace the earth with a reappearance in years to come. No, don't trust in riches. False gods. The Old Testament has a lot to say about false gods. You can find that everywhere, especially in the prophets. Don't trust in false gods. Don't trust in false uh, religious ideas. Don't trust in the things that human beings worship. Don't trust in lies. Don't trust in beauty. We're told not to trust in our own way. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. God has made us reasoning, rational creatures, but our ability to reason, this gift that God has given us, is always to be subject to the control of his word. And if we make human reason an end in itself, if it becomes the ultimate authority, we will certainly be led astray. And there are many intelligent, wise people who have formulated all kinds of doctrines that are antithetical to the clear teaching of Scripture. 
It's not because they're lacking in basic intelligence. It's because their reason has been commandeered by sin. They suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And they go their own way uh, in spite of uh, what God has made known in creation and in Scripture. No, we're not to trust in our own way. We're not to trust in military superiority. Trusting in ourselves, when you stop and think about it, rather than trusting in the Creator, is the prototypical human sin. And it's at the heart, really, of, of all of our sin and rebellion. I would even go so far as to argue this is what is going on at some level in the conversation between the serpent and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan basically challenges God's right to reign and rule and to set the, the, the boundaries of reality and, and, uh, and the way that Eve and Adam should think. Basically suggests to her God's keeping you from something. And the only way you're going to discover that is to strike out on your own. You use your own mind. Think for yourself. Experience life for yourself. Make your own. And then you can make a, you know, a, a proper decision. And so rather than trusting in God and trusting in his word, what does she do? Well, she believes the word of a talking serpent. And as we would say, the rest is a very sad history because her husband participates in her rebellion and he being the federal head of the human race plunges us all into a state of spiritual death and bondage to sin. Rather than trusting in any of these things, and this is the, the other side of the coin, rather than trusting in any of these things, the scriptures tell us to trust in God, and then they tell us what God is like. And here we could, you know, spend a lot of time just talking about some of the attributes of God, but I'll just remind you of things you probably already know. Who is God? He is the uncreated creator. Now, I just like saying that. There's just something about that that makes me want to stop and just think for a little while to pursue that forgotten spiritual discipline that was mentioned earlier by Michael, I think, meditation. The uncreated creator. Why would I trust in anybody other than him? Who could possibly be greater, no more? than the uncreated creator. Almost to put it in those terms is to answer your question. The Bible says more. The Bible says that he is from himself. We talk about that in terms, in theology, in terms of a saiety. He's from himself, which is just a fancy way of saying he's not, he's not bounded by uh, time. Uh, he will never cease to exist. He is not dependent upon anything for his existence. Instead, he's the source of life and breath and everything else. And then in addition to that, he's, he's those omnis, right? He's, he's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's uh, om, uh, omnipotent. So he is everywhere. He knows all things. He possesses all power. Our God is in heaven, the psalmist says in Psalm 115, verse 3. He does all that pleases him. Or Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, he works out all things after the counsel of his own will. The sovereignty of God, an amazing truth. God's absolute sovereignty, absolutely sovereign without destroying or making irrelevant human freedom and responsibility. And the great philosophical questions that, that can be asked. How can these things exist simultaneously? Many human beings don't think they can, so they come down on one side or the other. They either emphasize the sovereignty of God in such a way as to make human freedom a, a nothing, or they make human freedom 
is so important that God's sovereignty disappears. But the Bible teaches both things. God is absolutely sovereign, and human beings are free and responsible at the same time. That's what the uncreated uncreated creator uh, is like. That's how glorious he is. Can we understand how those things interact? No, no one's been able to explain that yet, and I'm not convinced that anyone will ever be able to totally explain it. It's a mystery that's, that's uh, lost, contained in God himself. And we will never get to the place of ever understanding all that there is to know about God. He is infinitely glorious, and we are, we are such small, finite creatures. And even when we're purged and cleansed from sin and we stand uh, redeemed with glorified bodies in the new heavens and new earth, we will still be finite creatures who will marvel at the uncreated creator, at the all-present, all-knowing, all-powerful one, the sovereign one who has made creatures in his image and likeness made them to interact with him, not as robots or as puppets, but as thinking, rational beings. Proverbs 21, verse 30 says, No wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. We should add to some of these attributes the fact that God is love. He loves all of his creation. He cares for it in many ways, but he has a special love for his people. He is holy. And of course, the holiness of God speaks first of his transcendence and of his, of his glory, but it also speaks of the fact that he is pure and separate from sin. He is wise. God knows the very best end, the very best goal, and he knows the very best way to get us there. And that, when you stop and think about it, is something that requires faith and trust on our part, living where we do at this point in time. Does God really know the best goal? Are his, are his purposes truly the best? And is this the best way to get us there? There are many people who would say, it sure doesn't look like that. If I were God, I wouldn't have done things this way. Why does he take so long? Why does he allow sin to, 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 to flourish? Why does he stand by while men and women take his name in vain and even have the audacity to deny his, his existence when he keeps their hearts beating in their chest. Why? Why does he allow his people to suffer? You can understand why David says, don't let me be put to shame. Why that's a, a cry that does come from the heart of a person that knows and loves the Lord and is clinging to the promises of God because in this life, so often the final embodiment of those promises is, is beyond us. We don't live long enough to see what God is really doing and how it is going to turn out in the end. The perfections of God, though, do engender trust in God, or should. David says, those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. And again, he says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. And the name of God, by the way, is not just a, a verbal designator. It's not just, you know, the, 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 the sounds of Yahweh or Adonai or El Shaddai or something like that, but it is the name of God speaking of the character of God that is revealed in that name. Trusting in the name of God is trusting in God and all of his glory. The God who has revealed himself most wonderfully in scripture and of course in the Lord Jesus. Well, the promises of God, I'll just highlight a few of these. Uh, God can be trusted because his word is true and he keeps his promises. I mean, he tells us that. Numbers chapter 23, he says, I'm not a, 
<laughs> I'm not a man. I don't lie. <laughs> Men and women, they lie all the time. They come out of the womb speaking lies. He says, I'm not like that. My word can be trusted. I promise something. You can, you can count on it. Uh, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7. And the Bible's full of what Peter talks about as great and precious promises that, of course, in Peter's context, in 2 Peter chapter 1, have to do with salvation as it's found in Jesus uh, Christ. Now, God has promised, for instance, never to leave us, never to forsake us. He has promised to be with us to the end of the age. He has promised to bring to completion the work that he has begun in us. He has promised that nothing less than uh, saving his people from their sins is his ultimate goal and objective. His name is Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, for he will save his people from their sins. Not he will just attempt to save them, he will save them from their sins. He is the good shepherd. And as the good shepherd, no one is able to pluck us out of his hand. His father who gave them to us, he says, is greater. No one's able to pluck them out of his hand. I and the father, he says, are one. Or we sometimes sing that chorus based on Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon fashioned against us will stand or succeed. We refute every tongue that rises against us in judgment because the Lord has promised to vindicate us. And then who can forget Romans chapter 8? If you ever discouraged, just read Romans 8. Just follow the argument of Paul from the beginning to the end. Who, who, he says, can lay a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who's going to have the audacity to try to accuse the people of God, people who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Jesus has died. He has risen from the dead. He's interceding for his people. And all of those things guarantee our absolute salvation. The actions of God, well, God has already been very busy in history. He did not abandon the world when it went astray at the beginning. Rather, he, in the context of the rebellion, began to speak about a redeemer. Initially, the language is very cryptic and mysterious. And if you don't read carefully, you might miss it altogether. But one day, he said... And the senate of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And that's the beginning of a long line of, of not just promises of God, but, but actions of God, preserving the race alive. And Adam and Eve giving birth to children. Of course, it doesn't go very well because uh, the second child kill, is killed by the first child. Cain kills Abel. But the story continues on, and God in space and in time uh, continues to work out his plan of salvation. Oh, there's a flood. There's the restoration. There's the Tower of Babel and the scattering of nations over the face of the earth. And then there's God coming to an old man and calling him to leave his land and to go to the land that God will show him. And on and on the biblical story goes until we come to the day in the wilderness when all of a sudden the silence of the Old Testament period was broken with the preaching of a, a man with a funny wardrobe named John the Baptist who started uh, proclaiming the word of the Lord and the power of the Spirit of God. And people were drawn to listen because when God speaks, people cannot help but listen. And his message was, was plain. Get ready. The Lord is coming to save his people. And in the words of Isaiah 40, comfort ye my people. Make, make a way in the wilderness. God is about to fulfill his promise. And that's what we find with the coming of Jesus. As Paul describes it in Galatians 
When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those under the law, that they might receive the adoption as sons. And this salvation is extended, of course, to, to Jews and Gentiles. It's for uh, all people everywhere who will look to God, God's Messiah and, and be saved. And the Gospels chronicle how that salvation is accomplished. It involves the life of Jesus, the sacrificial death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, his resurrection, his ascension on high, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and, and, and now this work of God that has been going on for 2,000 years where, where the gospel is being preached and where churches are established and reestablished in all parts of the world. And that process will continue until all the ransomed church of God have been saved to sin no more. In terms of examples of trust, well, I already read from Hebrews 11, and if you have time over the weekend, you could go in with great profit, just slowly read through that chapter and, and meditate on some of the people that are spoken about. Uh, in that section, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Moses, the remnant of Israel, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets. And then the preacher, writer, runs into the problem that we all run into. He ran out of time. He said, oh, I could go on and talk about others, but my time is up. <laughs> the Old Testament is full of Examples, And so is the New Testament. We come into the New Testament, we have Zechariah and Elizabeth, we have Mary and Joseph, we have John the Baptist, we have the apostles, including Paul. We've got people like Stephen, many others. Examples of faith, examples of individuals who put their trust in the Lord. Well, this brings me to my words of application. And I'm going to frame these in terms of the manifestation of trust in our lives as Christians. If we're trusting the Lord, what will this look like? How, how, does, this, how does this shape our lives? How does it give us direction in a post-pandemic society or time? Well, here's a few things for you to consider. If we trust in the Lord, we will obey the Lord because we believe that he knows what is best. Very simple, isn't it? But also very profound. If we say we trust in the Lord, we must obey the Lord. Trust and disobedience are incompatible with one another. Now, of course, none of us trust perfectly, and we are all marked by some level of disobedience. We are not yet glorified. But to the degree that we walk in disobedience, we are failing to trust in the Lord. Maybe that would alert us to the, 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 the wickedness, the sinfulness of disobedience. I'm supposed to be trusting in the Lord. When I deliberately flaunt his laws and, and, and live my life in a way that, that uh, his word does not condone, how can I say I'm trusting in him? So we say, Lord, forgive me. Help me to trust in you. It's actually a powerful, uh, powerful force in terms of our own sanctification. Help me to trust in you. The old hymn had it right, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trusting God will help us wait upon the Lord when he delays or when he is silent regarding our prayers or the fulfillment of his promises. This is one of the struggles of the Christian life, and we all face this. We are called upon in this present age to wrestle with delay. You know, where is the Lord? What does the Bible tell us to do? What do those who trust in the Lord do? They wait on the Lord. They wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they will wait even if death swallows them up because they're trusting in God. Though he slay me, I will see him. 
this, this is, you know, the conviction of, of, of those who see God and love God and trust in God. If he is waiting, he must have a good reason. If he's not answering my prayer as I have offered it to him, again, he must have a good reason. He knows what is best. I do not. My job is to trust him. There is nowhere else I can turn. There is no one else who can do for me what he does for me. I will trust in the Lord. Trusting in God will keep us from taking matters into our own hands as if we know better than God what we should do. Now this, now this is very appropriate. We're living in a day of frustration, and it's almost palpable in certain Christian settings. Christians are frustrated. They're frustrated with a lot of things. One of the things they're frustrated with is that the, that the veneer of Judeo-Christianity that they imagined existed in a country like Canada has disappeared. Never was as strong as you thought it might have been, but now we know for sure What do we do? Well, you know, when people are frustrated and they're maybe even a little fearful, let's just deal with the frustration. When they're frustrated, they can do all sorts of crazy things. And if I were to think of a, a, a biblical example of this, my mind immediately turns to Abraham. And it's ironic that it turns to Abraham because who's Abraham? He's the father of faith, is he not? Abraham. Read about him in Romans 4. And indeed, he is the father of faith. But it's interesting that when you read the life of Abraham, as we're told it in Genesis, that some of the, the biggest weaknesses and flaws and failures in his life were in the realm of faith. And the one I'm thinking about right now is he had the promise. Abraham, you're going to have a son. And my saving purposes are going to run through the line of that son. Well, when God makes the promise to Abraham, Abraham's an old man and his uh, wife is an old lady. And then, of course, this, the promise is not immediately fulfilled. The years go by and they begin to wonder, uh, <laughs> how is this going to happen? How is God going to fulfill his promise? How are we ever going to have a son? This is, this is getting beyond ridiculous. So they take matters into their own hands. Well, you can sleep with Hagar. She's younger. She'll be able to conceive a son. Maybe this is the way that, that God wants to accomplish his purposes. Just requires a little ingenuity on our part. Help God out. We believe his promise, but, you know, if he, if he waits much longer, it's just never going to happen. We, we'd better help him out. And so they do. And she has a son, all right, but he's not the son of promise. And it sets in motion a whole series of events and troubles for, for the promise line, although in the grace and mercy of God, in the end, even the descendants of Ishmael can be saved. So great is God's grace. But don't you see a parallel in our own time? We don't like what's happening in this country. We need to take matters into our own hands. We need to organize. We need to fight back. We need to let our voices be heard. We need to march in the streets. Sure, do what every other political lobby group does. But the problem is we're not another political lobby group. With the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're spiritual. And, and why that's important is because these spiritual weapons are more powerful than any carnal weapon than you can imagine. You may be able to drive a great big truck down to Ottawa, but that's not going to change what really needs to change in this country. What needs to change is the Word of God needs to be proclaimed in the power of the Spirit of God, and that can change lives in a way that we can't even imagine because it's been a long time since we've seen anything close to revival in this country. Long, long time. Oh, yeah, we got a lot of churches, a lot of programs. But by and large, most of it's as dead as a doornail. 
just going through the motions. You get all these places and yet the country just continues. Why does it going in the direction it's going? Well, because there's just fewer and fewer people know the Lord. Well, you're not going to convince non-Christian people of Christian truth. Why would you? Why would they go along with that? Stop and think about it. This is the weakness of politics. It requires, you know, you, you building a consensus. And how in the world are you going to talk <laughs> people who are in rebellion against God to go along with your moral agenda when they don't share that moral agenda? Our job really is to be a, a, a community apart, a Christian counterculture that bears witness to the glory of the world to come. That's our real job. And if in the providence of God, God blesses the word and there are seasons of revival which do happen throughout the gospel age, thankfully, then, you know, you could see people going to the ballot box and, and voting in a certain direction because what? Well, because God has given them eyes to see and ears to hear. But if that doesn't happen, no, no. It'll never work. What you'll find yourself doing is making all kinds of ungodly alliances. Just like the nation of Israel trying to preserve your power and your freedom. Trust in God. If we trust in God, we'll not be afraid. I'll just be very quick here. When we're afraid, we take our eyes off of the Lord. But if we're trusting God, we keep our eyes on him. If we trust in God, we'll be content with what he's given us. That's hard. He's promised to give us good things and to hold nothing back that we really need. It's basically what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, if he's given his son for us, which he has, how will he not along with him give us freely all things? He's given the greatest gift. He won't hold back anything that we really need, and we need to believe that. We need to trust in him. He tells us that we're to ask him for our daily bread. We're to seek first his kingdom, and we must believe that he will provide us with that daily bread, and that if we seek first his kingdom... Uh, everything else that we really need will be given to us. Well, then, last but not least, those who trust in God will act in faith. They'll act in faith. William Carey, that famous uh, statement of his, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God, kind of captures that, doesn't it? We trust in God, we act in faith. Don't think that I'm against Christians being involved in every area of life, including the political area, I'm not. But what we have to distinguish uh, is the role of, of the church of Jesus Christ as the church of Jesus Christ and our individual roles as Christians living in whatever society we happen to be living on, on the face of the earth. The fact of the matter is that the church of Jesus Christ can flourish in any political situation. Some situations make it easier for us than others, but we're not limited by whether it's a king or a, a tyrant or a democracy. The gospel of Jesus Christ is more powerful than that. We sell it short by acting the way we do sometimes. You're really concerned about the, the state of uh, the nation? And cast yourself upon the mercy of God and start to pray. And start to share the faith with others and and ask that God would, would move in an unusual way and be merciful and gracious. But we don't know what God is going to do. One thing he does call us to do is to suffer and to be prepared to suffer for his name's sake. And perhaps suffering will be necessary first before there is any great awakening. Maybe the great awakening will never come again. Maybe we're closer to the end than we know. I don't know. These are all mysteries. But I do know that we must continue to Trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not in our own understanding. In all our ways acknowledge him, and he will make our paths straight. Amen.